Welcome. Welcome to worship again this evening at Bethel Church. I want to welcome those visiting with us. Uh, celebrations always bring some extra folks out, and uh, we welcome you to this, this service this evening. Uh, no announcements, I guess, so let's stand and ask God to bless our time of worship together. Father, we are entering into your presence once again, into this place, this place set aside and dedicated for worship. We know we live always in your presence, but in a special way we come together on a day you set aside. And we pray that our time together may be encouraging, that our time together may be lifted up, be lifting up for us, a lifting up experience, but also that, and most of all, that your name receives the glory, the praise, and the honor from people whom you have touched by your grace and redeemed through Jesus Christ. So bless our time together, receive our worship, cleanse it of everything that's faulty, so that it comes before your throne as the offering of grateful people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 91. And this, what this psalm tells us is, is the result of what Job learned a little bit, as we'll hear it a little bit later. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God is my trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. So we sing together, Come all you people, praise our God. The three stanzas, number 242 in the Psalter, in the Grace Psalter, but it'll be on your screen as well. 242. this God in whom we trust. Receive His greeting, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. Amen. As God has greeted us, let's turn now and welcome and greet one another. May be seated. When I uh, looked at the uh, scriptures that I would wanted to read for uh, our message from the end of Job, for those who are visiting, we've been 
every time I have a, have a chance to be here, we've been going through the book of Job in for, I don't know, about five, this is the fifth one, I think. Anyway, uh, so a little gap between times, but uh, we'd like to kind of bring this to a conclusion tonight. And when I looked at the scriptures, I wanted to read it. It was, I thought, way too long for uh, uh, our prior to the message reading. So I thought, we'll read part of it now, and we'll sing a song from the uh, Blue Psalter that uh, responds to this, uh, to this message. But uh, Job, Job 38, where the Lord answers Job out of the storm. You know, when we read the book of Job, we, we expect, as I will suggest later on, a, a simple answer to what's going on in his life. Why didn't God just make it very clear what's, what's happening? Well, God doesn't do that. In fact, He uh, begins by establishing the distance between Himself, the Creator, and us, His creatures. So let's read together from uh, Job 38. It's found on page 495, page 495 in the, in the Psalter. And uh, I'll read it. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who, measured, who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors or when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the, garment, uh, the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may go, come and no further, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning, the Creator says to His creatures, or shown the dawn its place, that it may take the, the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arms are broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Where is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the, path, the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You, you have lived so many years, and you feel a little cynicism in those words. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the, the storehouses of the hail, which are reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered above the earth? Who cut the, a, a channel for the torrents of rain or, and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives and a desert where no ma, with no one in it? To satisfy the desolate wasteland and to make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the dew, drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to frost from the heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen... Can you bind the beautiful Pleiade, 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 Pleiades, I get. or can you loosen the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the consolation in their seasons or lead the bear with its cubs? And he's talking about the galaxies. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a cloud of water, with a flood of water? Can you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? 
Can you hunt the prey for the lioness or satisfy the hunger of lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket? Who provides food for the raven when their young cry out to God or wander about for lack of food? And he goes on in that vein. The greatness of a creator speaking to one of his creatures about his greatness. Let's sing together words from the blue psalter. Uh, the seven verses, the seasons are fixed by wisdom divine. Let's sing those words together. Yes. Before we move on in the book of Job, let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can see pictures of your, your majesty, pictures of your power, your creative wisdom, your control. We pray that we may see what Job was allowed to see. Something that shook him, but something that reassured him. Something that made him feel puny, 
but at the same time saw him, made him see himself as an object of a Creator's love and a Creator's grace, a Creator's mercy and power. Help us to understand that we always live under the control and the governance of a sovereign Creator. And in all the struggles of our lives, we know whom we belong to. To govern our, our thinking, our proclaiming, our listening, our doing, our believing, our trusting. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few verses now from Job chapter 40. First of all, verses 6 and 7. And the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Now we move on to verse 15. Look at the behemoth. And some said it's the elephant, some say it's the hippopotamus. More likely the hippopotamus. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox, whose strength, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar, the sinews of his thighs are close-knit, his bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like rods of iron. He ranked first among the works of God, yet his maker can approach him with a sword. The hills bring him their produce, and all the wild animals play nearby. Under the lotus plants he lies, hidden among the reeds in the marsh. The lotuses conceal him in their shadow. The poplars by the stream surround him. When the river rages, he is not alarmed. He is secure, though the Jordan should surge against his mouth. Can anyone capture him by the eyes or trap him or pierce his nose with a hook? 41. Can you pull the leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose and, or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he keep begging you for mercy? Will he speak to you with gentle words? Will he make an agreement with you for, for you to take him as your slave for life? Can you make a pet, make him a pet of him like a bird and put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders barter for him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you hide, uh, fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? If you lay a hand on him, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope for subduing him is false. A mere sight of him is overpowering. No one is fierce enough to arouse him. Who then is able to stand against him? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under, under the heaven belongs to me. And then we move into chapter 24. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscure, obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My eye, ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Thus far the reading of the Word of God. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we all know the difference between only hearing something with our ears or seeing it with our eyes. We tend to believe what we see with our eyes more quickly than what we only hear with our ears. We know how stories of events and details can get exaggerated and distorted when only heard with our ears and passed on from one set of ears to another. So we would prefer to see with our eyes. For then we can say, I saw it with my own eyes. I, I, I was there. I saw it. But even seeing does not always guarantee accuracy. Two people may look at the same event and see it entirely differently. 
Two witnesses to an accident may tell, of, uh, tell different, a different story. The offending car was green. No, the offending car was red. You know how people distort stuff. And so it was with the suffering of Job. His, his, his four friends are, are looking at his suffering. At their friend Job sitting on this ash pile, scraping pus from his boils with a broken piece of pottery. And they saw, his friends saw just one thing. They saw Job being punished for his sins. They saw a Job receiving what he deserved. They saw a case where God was not perverting justice, but giving Job what his sins deserved. Job, cer certainly you must have a secret life that we don't know about. Job, the wages of sin are death. Don't you know that? And sad as it is, that's, that's why your children died in that freak windstorm. Job, don't you know there's only one law at work in the universe? A law of sinners getting what they deserve. That's, that's the only reality any one of us deal with. Basically what they saw, what they said. But after the first three friends had each made the same basic assessment of how they saw the suffering of Job, the young man Elihu spoke up and told how he saw the suffering of Job. He scolds his friends for not convincing Job of the truth that there is this one law in operation in the universe, the law of getting, we get what we deserve. Job, you are but a well-deserved victim of God's justice. But at the same time, he, he scolds Job for trying to justify himself. He scolds Job, Job for, for trying uh, to convince his friends that the God he knew, the God he heard about, the God he trusted, was more than a God of justice alone. There is more to this God than only justice. He had experienced God's forgiveness. He had in good faith offered sacrifices to this God on behalf of His children. His sins did not seem to deserve the kind of justice He was experiencing, the kind of suffering. But young Elihu opens his mouth to speak, having waited for the older guys to speak first. And his words really don't sound very different from any of the other fellows that spoke. He, he sounds too like a stuck record. He claims to be speaking with wisdom that the Holy Spirit of God had given him, but he goes no further than what already has been said. His words are, God repays a man for what he has done. He brings upon himself what his co conduct deserves. That's how he saw it. He looked with his eyes at the suffering of his friend and came up with that rather simple explanation. Well, let's conclude our rather brief look at, <clears throat> at the book of Job, certainly not doing it justice entirely, by listening as God creates a picture for Job to see, a picture which allows Job to conclude, my ears have heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. In some ways, God's response to Job and his friends at the end of this book disappoint us. At least if we expected a simple and straight answer. We sort of expected, you know, that at the end of the book, God would reveal to Job what is going on in Job's life. He would tell him about this suffering as the result of a challenge that, that Satan had given to God, a challenge that God was willing to accept. That is, God was willing to have His work in and for Job, this man of faith. He was willing to have that work tested. He was willing to prove to Satan his, that, that Job did not love God because God made him rich. There is more to God's work in Job than that. His work is deeper, it's richer, it's more powerful. We expect that God would explain all of that to Job to clear the air and answer all his troubling and agonizing questions. Doesn't Job deserve an explanation? We think we deserve answers as to the why of our struggles, our suffering. Why? 
we often ask. But God doesn't give Job a straight answer. Instead, he paints a picture for Job to see. We read that God answered Job out of the whirlwind, and his answer begins with a series of questions. Who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? That's God's rebuke of Job, but as well as a rebuke of his friends, who presume to, to have answers to all the, 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 the questions. But their, but their ignorance was very evident. Here are these puny men, in a sense, sitting on earth, one of them, one of them sitting on an ash pile, presuming to know how God works, presuming to know what God is up to in every case, presuming to give answers. They didn't have a clue, and yet they speak. They, arcan, they darken the wisdom of God with their ignorance. They twist what God is doing in Job's life with their lack of understanding. Really, they're saying far more than they knew. People do that at times. You know, we speculate, we make judgments, we presume to comfort, but we really don't know that much about what God is doing in another person's life. We really don't know the purposes. We really don't know how this is going to serve their salvation or the coming of the kingdom. Perhaps sometimes we would do well to, to do what Job said after listening to God's first speech. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once but have no answer twice, but I will say no more. Often we would do well just sometimes to keep our mouth shut and just listen, huh? And so in answer to Job and his friends whose ignorance is glaring, God speaks. He speaks as the powerful creator, first of all. He creates a vast difference, vast distance rather, between himself, the creator, and us, his creatures, by asking Job a series of questions. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Who marked off the dimensions of the earth? Tell me if you are so wise. Who shut the sea behind its door and set its limits? Who, ha, have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Where is the way to the abode of light? Do you know? Where is, where is the place, the way to the place from which lightning is dispensed? Can you control the journeys of the constellations? Job, can you? Do you know the laws of heaven? Did you give the horse its strength? Or does the hawk take, fly, uh, take flight by your wisdom? Does the eagle soar at your command? Are we beginning to get the picture? The picture of a creator whose power, whose wisdom is vastly superior to Job's and to ours. A picture of a, of a creator whose distance from us is vast. In the throes of his suffering, Job has often demanded of God an answer, a, a, a demand that somehow sometimes took the shape of, I am Job, who are you, God, to do this to me? What are you doing? You're answerable to me, to Job. God, God, you have to tell me what you're doing. God, you're required to explain yourself to me, Job. But then the picture begins to emerge as God speaks, and He asks these questions of Job. And the picture is, I am God, who are you? You are Job. I'm not answerable to you. Can you accuse me of doing wrong when the distance between us in terms of, of power and wisdom is so great? When you have no clue as to how I created all of this, how I gave the laws which are obeyed by such big things as galaxies and constellations and, and laws that are obeyed by hawks and, and deer and eagles and amoebas, genes. I am the creator of all of this. 
you are but one of my creatures. Must, must I explain myself to you? Must I justify myself to you? That's when Job vows to shut up and listen. But then God goes on and he asks more questions of Job, but for a different purpose. Look at that behemoth I created, the hippopotamus who lives in the river. He's not afraid of the raging river. His tail swings like a cedar tree. His bones are like tubes of bronze. Have you noticed his strength? Can you capture him and put a ring in his nose? No, but I can approach him with no more than a sword. Then he goes on in chapter 41. Can you pull a leviathan with a, with a fish hook? And the leviathan is very likely a huge river crocodile. Can you make a pet out of him and put a leash on him so that your little girls can lead him? Can you open his mouth? He's a creature without fear. There's no creature like him. I created him. I control him. I made him powerful, as powerful and defiant as he is. I created the environment in which he lived. Now, why does, why does God single out those, those two fierce, powerful creatures? And he talks about more creatures, of course, but why does he single out those two? Because, because they live in the water, in the river. They, they hide under the water, and, and, and it, they each, in the minds of people, are symbols of fear. In those days, people looked at the, at the sea or the river, and what, the, what was hidden in there is something to be feared. Each represents something that's, that lives in the river, hiding among the locust, uh, lo, lotus trees, the leaves lurking, ready to strike the unsuspecting. But you know what, Job? I created them. I control them. They obey my commands. I put them on a leash. I created where they live. And you know what God is saying to Job? Behemoth, Leviathan, the symbols, symbols of Satan, symbols of the evil one, the one who is the basic cause of so much pain and suffering in a fallen world, the one who brought by his temptations death into the creation, as well as painful boils and freak windstorms and camel rustlers and sheep stealers. He creates the chaos. But Job, remember, I'm the creator. I hold him on a leash. He goes so far and no further. He operates under my will and under my leave. I control him as surely as I control those two symbols of evil, behemoth and leviathan. Job, this thing you suffer is a created, a creature thing. It belongs in the realm of a fallen creation. The one afflicting you is a creature. He operates in the realm of creation, which means that none of these things that afflict you, none of the, the evil that, that, that you are suffering takes on any kind of sovereignty in your life. No suffering, not even death, takes on the role of a creator, a sovereign creator. Nothing we suffer becomes a king. No force of evil ever becomes sovereign. The evil one is never Lord. Prince, maybe. New Testament calls him the prince of the power of the air. But he's never on a throne. In fact, he's fallen from his throne at the death of Jesus Christ. So, so, so Job... You're dealing with a mere creation that's, that's answerable to me. Your suffering was, was that you're dealing with is something on a leash under the command of a sovereign creator, and all of it is totally answerable to me. All of it must fit my purpose. So are you still going to accuse me, Job? Am I still answerable to you? No. No, says Job, I, I put my hand over my mouth. I've heard of you, but now I see you with my eyes. A whole new perspective opens up for this suffering one. 
The Creator, the Sovereign Creator God is at the helm, guiding all of these things in Job's life. Evil is never under, under, in, in control. The evil one is never sovereign. The God he loved, the God he trusted, was in charge, allowing even evil to serve his sovereign purpose. And he's not always answerable to us as to what that purpose was or is. Now we can go back to chapters 1 and 2 to, uh, for ourselves and, and know the purpose for God's testing of His work in and for Job. But Job's not privy to that information. It has to be enough for Job to humble himself and to know that the God he loves, the God he's trusted for the forgiveness of his sins and his children's sins, is the Creator, the Sovereign Creator, who keeps evil, an evil one on a leash, to accomplish His purposes for us and in us. And that's what God's people need to see with the eyes of faith. Perhaps Paul best shapes what our eyes are to see when we, when we think of suffering and God's role in our lives. Paul put it this way for us. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the picture that God wants us to see in all the struggles of our lives. The God that Job loved was the God who first loved Job and was willing to prove the power of His work in him and for him. But the suffering, the one who caused the suffering, were all under the control of the Sovereign One, the Sovereign Creator, the Creator of Behemoth and Leviathan. This is the God we belong to through Jesus Christ's work. May our eyes see Him as He truly is, the God from whose love nothing can separate us. By the way, after the testing, God blessed Job again with more than he had before, twice as much. This time 15,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys, and again seven sons and three more daughters. And that's the picture we are encouraged to see with the eyes of hope, that now look in the direction of eternal life, in a new heaven and a new earth, which awaits all of those whom God loves and who, who see Him as the God of grace in Jesus Christ. After that, we have suffered a little while. There will be for all of God's people a new heaven and a new earth, for death, pain, suffering, tears will be no more. Do our eyes see that? Amen. Thank you, Father, for a picture. We live in a world that's lost sight of you, a world that's lost sight of your, your greatness, your, your law for human life, your law for marriage, your law for protecting life. But Father, we pray, we pray that as your people we may leave this place recognizing that you are our Creator God, a sovereign God. All things are in your hand. You keep evil on a leash. It goes no further than, than where you will it. And it all somehow fits into the sovereign purpose of a Heavenly Father. Help us to see that with the eyes of faith and all the struggles and trials of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 542, the ends of all the earth shall hear and turn unto the Lord in fear. Let's sing those words together. Stand as we say. <laughs>
God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now and we ask that we may live always in that awareness of your Lordship, that we may always live cognizant of the fact that every knee will bow to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and everyone will in time acknowledge that you are the sovereign God, the creator of all. In the meantime, Father, we live in a troubled world, a world that denies your existence, a world that serves false gods, a world driven by fanaticism claiming to follow the direction of a false god. We live in a world of abortion, a world of some strange ideas about marriage and what it can be, a world where the language of faith becomes a, a foreign language that many folks don't even understand anymore. Father, into this world we pray for the spread of the gospel. Into this world we pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to change hearts and minds, to change people's vision of what is, who you are, who is Lord. We pray, Father, that you will bless the spread of your gospel into your world, that wars may cease, that people may learn to live together in peace, that the purposes of fanaticism and extremism may be curbed and frustrated. We pray, Father, that you will work powerfully in your world through the gospel, through the power of your Spirit bringing people to you. But then we, we remember Jesus' statement, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And that troubles us. And we ask, will you build your church and keep your people strong that we may be at the forefront of spreading the gospel around the world so that there may be faith, that our children and grandchildren and children to come may come to know you, that they may learn to pay homage to you too because they've been taught the way of truth. Oh, Father, we pray for your world. We pray for the spread of the gospel. We pray that you'll bless the missionaries that we as a church send out. We pray for Vasi and Miranda in, in Ukraine, that you will keep them in your care, and that you will help them to be a witness in that troubled part of the world, that you will also, for the sake of your church and the sake of peace there, curb the power-grabbing demands of Russian dictators. But Father, we pray, make these folks that we send there a witness to you. Bless them as a family. Pray, Father, for the work of Josh and Joni in, in Nicaragua. Care for them. Give them what they need. Provide for them. And help them, too, to spread your word, your truth. We pray, Father, that you will also care for the Kuipers as they teach pastors to spread the gospel in Mexico, encourage them. We pray that many get, may get trained, and as they get trained, may take that training along with a dedication to speak that true gospel. We pray, Father, for the work of the Sorens also in Costa Rica, training people there too, pastors, training in the gospel, how to teach, how to proclaim, and we pray that here too your work may go forth with power. So, Father, around the world, all the missionaries sent out by the Christian Reformed Church and, and Bible-believing churches, bless their work. Gather your people. Bring them in. Heavenly Father, we pray, too, that you will bless the work of farmer to farmer. We pray the work, the, the work of World Renew and uh, the work of the Back to God Hour. Bless these agencies and this, this work and these causes and we pray, Heavenly Father, that lives may be touched and lives changed for the sake of Jesus Christ, that His gospel and His truth may take on a reality and a truth in people's lives. 
Father, we pray that you will care for all the folks who need you in any special way. As the pastor made the list this morning of folks dealing with cancer, as folks have lost loved ones, as folks are dealing with heartaches in terms of tragic mistakes in life and prison sentences and divided families. And Father, you know these folks, and we pray that you care for them. You give them what they need. Give healing, give peace, and help us all to know that in these struggles and sufferings of life, you are God. You keep evil on a leash. You allow it to go no, so far and no further. You can bring miraculous healings. You can, you can bring peace where there is turmoil. So, Father, as, as folks on behalf of loved ones say their prayers, make their pleas, maybe sometimes even bargain with you, will you hear our earnest prayer? And will you be our faithful God? caring for all of those who have special needs among us and in our families, loved ones, wherever they are. Heavenly Father, go with us this week in the work and the tasks of the week ahead. We pray for a good week of education for our young people at college, at Dort, at, at Western Unity, at our local Christian school and other Christian schools where they attend, perhaps Ireton. We pray, Father, that you'll go with those young people and and our children and help them to learn that may the, the truth that they're taught sink deep and create in them hearts of understanding and wisdom so that they may dedicate their lives to serving you and your kingdom. Father, we need workers in your kingdom in, this, in a troubled world. We need people who will stand up to be your witnesses to speak with gentleness of the hope that is within us. And Father, if we have opportunity to do this, that this week, help us to do that with courage, with gentleness, speaking your truth, and bless those opportunities. Continue to care for those who doing, are doing the harvesting. We thank you for the harvest, that it's coming in, and we pray that you will continue to bless and that it may come to a successful conclusion and that we may use the proceeds wisely. Continue to care for us. Continue to care for this church. Give wisdom to the, to the consul, and Pastor John and Mary Jo. Provide for them good wisdom to lead well, to continue to bring your word with, with sincerity, with power, with truth, so that your kingdom may grow, your church may grow, and we may leave this place, Sunday after Sunday, with renewed energy to serve you. So, Father, go with us. Forgive our sins of today. We ask this all now as we give our gifts, and we pray that you'll multiply these gifts for the sake of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Mission and Evangelism Outreach Fund, we present to God the gifts that we have brought.
Let's stand now and use some articles of our world belongs to God as our confession of faith, Article 7, 8, 9, and 13. Let's stand together as we do this. We say together, our world belongs to God, not to us or earthly powers, not to demons, faith, or chance. The earth is the Lord's. In the beginning, God, Father, Word, and Spirit called this world into being out of nothing and gave it shape and order. God formed the land, the sky, and the seas, making the earth a fitting home for the plants, animals, and humans he created. A world was filled with color, beauty, and variety. It provided room for work and play, worship and service, love and laughter. God rested and gave us rest. In the beginning, everything was good. God directs and bends to his will all that happens in truth. As history unfolds in ways we only know in part, all things from crops to graves, from jobs to laws, are under his control. God is present in our world by his word and spirit. The faithfulness of our great provider is sense to our days and hope to our years. The future is secure. Our world belongs to God. Oh, for a closer walk with God. Let's sing those verses together. his holy name will be our doxology. Let's receive God's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his face towards you and grant you his peace. Amen.